Welcome to the 2016 Alaska Fire Presentation Series. It is being brought to you by the Alaska Natural Resource and Outdoor Education Association, or ANRO. ANRO is dedicated to promoting and implementing excellence in natural resource, outdoor, and environmental education for all Alaskans. My name is Kathy Rezebeck, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, Jennifer Barnes. For the last 13 years, Jennifer has worked as the Alaska Regional Fire Ecologist for the National Park Service and is located in Fairbanks, Alaska. She has a master's in plant ecology from Utah State University. Today she will be talking about tundra fires in a changing climate. Welcome Jennifer. Thank you, Kathy. So today we're going to be talking about tundra fires and how they may be changing with climate and just uh, getting some background on, on fires and fire ecology and tundra and then moving into what the potentials are for the change in, in tundra fires, how much area might be burning and what the effects of that might be. Most of my work has been in no attack and also on the Seward Peninsula. So we'll draw for some, from some of those examples and then also pulling in recent literature and some of the studies that have gone on in tundra over the last 10 to 15 years. The boreal forest and the tundra are adapted to fire. Almost 66 million acres have burned in the last 65 years, and that's almost a million acres per year. There's been a lot of question about how frequent fires are in tundra, and if you look at some of the older literature, most of it often said that tundra fires were infrequent and often small. Some of that is due to the fact that there was not good detection of fires. Sometimes they weren't, they weren't found because they're fairly fast burning. And then sometimes it's just because some of the regions don't have as much fire activity up in the tundra areas. If you look at this fire history map, and these are just the fire perimeters, so larger fires that have occurred in Alaska, the majority of the fires actually occur um, in the boreal region, if you look at where the large fires and often lightning caused fires have burned, our fire records mostly go back to about 1940. And these, these perimeters, as you can see, the color patches along here, you see in between the Brooks Range to the north and the Alaska Range to the south. You do see some fires down on the Kenai. And then you, as you look across into the tundra areas, you see fire patches along the Seward Peninsula, on the southwest um, coast of Alaska, and then also up in the no attack and into the North Slope region. So although fires look like they're mostly occurring in the boreal forest, the, the tundra areas do have fires that occur. The fire history in Alaska is variable. As you can see from this graph that shows the fire records from 1950 to 2015, you can see time periods when there has been relatively small fires or fire years. This is the total acres burned. Um, and then as you look towards the last two decades since 2000, you see a lot of a lot more area has burned. And this is statewide for Alaska. So the, the largest fire season on record was the 2004 fire season when we burned almost 6.7 million acres. Um, the second largest fire season occurred just last year in 2015. The third actually was in 1957, and then the fourth was in 2005. One of the things that we're seeing with um, potentially our, our changing weather conditions and climate change is that we're, we're seeing more uh, frequency of large fire years occurring in Alaska. How this might be affecting um, fires in the tundra, we'll have yet to see. So when we look at a map that shows where we have tundra, and that's the brown area um, on this map, and that's using uh, the circumpolar uh, vegetation map. Uh, you can see that there's fires that occur down in the southwest on the Seward Peninsula, and then up in the no attack in the, in the North Slope region. Almost 6.8 million acres of fires have burned in the tundra area. So a little about fire and um, how it burns in the, in the tundra, and we can call it um, tussock tundra or shrub, shrub tundra. I'll show some examples of different types of vegetation types in tundra. But in general, tundra is considered a place where 
it's treeless, often has permafrost underneath, and it's they're cold sites, so it's kind of limiting the, the tree expansion into those areas. The fire behavior in those these type of um, ecosystems are generally fast moving, often wind driven fires. Um, they're considered a grass, a grass shrub fire, um, and they're a little they react a little bit differently than than a boreal forest fire. The fire return intervals, and we'll talk more about this, can vary anywhere from 100 to thousands of years. And the fire return interval just means the amount of time between successive, successive fires in an area. In general, if you read the literature or if you observe a fire after, after a, a year or even just a couple weeks after a, a tundra fire, the plants generally tend to re-sprout readily. They, they come back fairly quickly. This photo in the right-hand side shows uh, a fire one year post fire and you see all of the areophorum or the tussocks, the cotton tussock grass blooming um, abundantly because of the, the fire that occurred there the year previously. As I mentioned, the, the fires, the fire behavior in tundra, it tends to be a fine fuel driven fire system and that means that um, it has, it's burning in the graminoids, which could be grasses and or, or sedges or, or tussocks, the dead grass, the thatch of that uh, material, the mosses and lichens, and it also is being driven by, by the shrubs. But in a fine fuel driven system, um, it's very responsive to temperature and winds, the relative humidity and the amount of precipitation. Generally, these fires are gonna be a lot shorter duration than what you might see in a boreal forest. So if you think about some of the fires that have occurred in, um, in the interior, these fires can often burn from June all the way until the snow flies in, in September or October. Most often, a lot of the tundra fires are fairly rapid. They'll burn for one to two weeks, and then either rain will come through and put them out, um, or, uh, well, usually that's the cause of most fires going out in, in the tundra. But that is not always the case, and we may see with climate change, longer duration fires occurring. So a little bit about fire ecology um, and just kind of some basic backgrounds of fire ecology and tundra. The term tundra can encompass a lot of different vegetation types. You have um, across the top some examples of, of tundra that are more sedge component, the, the top uh, left here are kind of considered basically uh, tussock shrub tundra. And this is another one. You can see the large uh, tussocks here that are almost like bowling balls walking on when you go through it. And then this, this um, site over here to the right is basically frost boils. It's got some herbaceous plants and low shrubs, dwarf shrubs, um, and a little bit rocky. There's all sorts of different types of, of tundra when you call things tundra. The, the photos along the bottom are more shrub tundra. Um, this is a low to dwarf shrub tundra. Um, this one is prim primarily uh, shrub birch or dwarf birch. And this is basically a willow uh, shrub tundra. So how do these all look when they burn? All of this, these pictures are of similar vegetation types or of the same site um, burned one year afterwards. Uh, this, these, uh, these systems tend to respond fairly quickly and resprout fairly readily after a fire, but not always. Um, you can see some of these areas that are more black and still, and this had a lot more shrub component into it. Um, and you can see the willows here, but there's some re-sprouting of those. These frost boils, uh, the lichens across the top, um, the drier sites, uh, you know, burned in between these, these uh, crevices that are formed because of permafrost. In general, fires are going to affect vegetation succession and distribution. They're gonna they can also affect wildlife habitat. Um, in Alaska, they can influence permafrost, nutrient cycling, the hydrology, and air quality. All of those are fire effects that we see after any type of fire that occurs. The tundra fire regimes 
generally, it's one of the larger uh, natural disturbance in tundra ecosystems. Um, it uh, Generally, the season is between late May through July. You do see some fires starting in, in August, um, but that, if you're looking at lightning-caused fires, uh, they're generally going to be May through July when we get our, our lightning storms coming through. I'll give some examples of some paleo studies that uh, look at the fire regimes and how they vary um, in tundra. And I'll explain a little more about what these paleo studies mean. So I mentioned these kind of Arctic tundra areas in, in Alaska. We have um, above the Brooks Range, and you can see that there's not too much for fire history. These gray patches are, are areas that have burned. This is the Anaktivik River fire, which is one of the largest fires that's have occurred above the North Slope or above the Brooks Range there. Um, the Noatak region, this is the Noatak River, and um, there's fairly frequent fire occurring in that area. And then on the Seward Peninsula, there's some very large fires that have occurred down there. A lot of the fires are actually from the early 1950s and the 1977. Um, in recent history, we haven't seen quite as many fires occurring in that area. So there's been interest to figure out um, how common tundra fires really are. And one of the techniques that can be used is, is uh, called lake coring. And we use these, this tool, basically, it assumes that during a fire, um, you get charcoal that is given off from, the, from either um, the air or coming across through the water or across the ground and washing into lakes. And then you take these cores from the bottom of the lake where this charcoal has occurred, and these, uh, the, the cores will get this layering of different, the pollen and also whether there was fires in that area. And so using that type of information, they can go back thousands to thousands of years to look at the vegetation and the likelihood of, of fire occurring in that area by just looking at the charcoal pieces that have fallen into the water um, or the, the lake that they cord. The no attack uh, has uh, fairly short fire return intervals. The Brooks Range has pretty long fire return intervals. Um, the North Slope has even longer, 3,000 to 7,000 years. And the, the YK Delta, which is that southwest area, has very long fire return intervals in between it from our past coring records. So what drives fire? Um, clearly, weather is a huge driver in fire. The amount of precipitation, the temperature, the winds, uh, storms, which can cause uh, lightning occurring, and the humidity will al also uh, uh, drive whether a fire burns and how it burns. The fuels are also important. The type of vegetation that's there and how dry. Um, so, if you have a, a grass type and it doesn't, and it's been raining on it, it it's probably not going to burn. Um, but if you have had hot, dry weather and you have and it's a bunch of dead thatch, it will probably burn fairly well. The other type of vegetation differences we're talking about for fuels is the differences between you know, lichens or shrubs or, or these uh, grass type vegetation. So all of that's gonna influence whether fire will burn. And then clearly ignitions is also important. How much lightning is out there and also people. Um, several of the fires on the Seward Peninsula are, are human caused. Um, most, most of the other ones, except, um, you know, there are occasional human-caused fires that, um, in the tundra, but because of the remoteness, you don't see the, the amount of it as you do along road systems, I would say. But climate change can impact all of these drivers. So if you think about climate, um, it's all the weather pulled together. Uh, climate could also influence what vegetation is out there. And it also could in influence the amount of um, lightning, and it may influence uh, where people live and or how they uh, may start fires. So climate is going to be a, a huge factor in how, how frequent fires occur. In the literature and also, um, well, in the literature and on the news, you hear a lot about uh, 
increasing temperatures and we see it in Alaska, uh, warmer summers, um, earlier summers, and certainly the prediction for Alaska is that we are, we are in an unprecedented warming phase right now. Um, these, so there's some, some studies here by uh, Bott. There's several other studies that have come out since this, this, this paper that talks about um, increasing temperatures uh, in the northern regions, in the boreal regions, or the uh, Arctic regions of, of the Alaska and the rest of the Arctic regions. Another factor is uh, shrub expansion. Um, how will that change our fires in the tundra area? How will it change the vegetation that's there and how will that change um, how it will burn? Um, and will the, the shrub expansion outcompete uh, the lichens that used to be there? These are all questions that are coming from current research about the conditions in, in the Arctic tundra. So clearly some of the impacts of climate change on fire, and this goes for almost anywhere you look in the, where fire occurs, is that you may see increased area burned and an increased number of fires started. Um, all of this can result in shortened re fire return intervals. So if you burn an area and then it burns again, you're gonna have these shortened fire return intervals. It's also, um, potential that it's going to increase the, the severity of fires, and I'll give you some examples of burn severity in a few minutes here. And there's also potential for the changes in fire season and the duration of fires. Are we going to start seeing fires starting earlier, or are we going to start seeing um, the, the time, the, the length of how long the fires burn, um, particularly in tundra, um, will we see longer duration fires occurring? This study from uh, Young et al. in 2016 shows models predicting using temperature and um, the PET, which is an evapo uh, precipitation evapotranspiration as a model um, and, and forecasting with our predicted uh, climate change, how we might see changes in our future fire regimes in in Alaska. And if you look across, there's the top row has um, the global cl climate models are, there's five of them pulled together, but you can see that there's a lot of red, dark red, which means that they're predicting more fires to occur um, in 2007 or in the, in the next decade or 100 years, excuse me, um, mm. yeah, up in the, the northern regions of Alaska. Um, they also have, if we use the, the coolest uh, uh, GCM, it doesn't look quite as extreme, but, but definitely from this paper, they're suggesting that we're going to see a, an increase in fires in the tundra area. So are we seeing that or will we see it? One of the things that that definitely struck us, as I've mentioned before, the no attack region definitely has a lot of fires. But in 2010, we had over 40 fires that um, that occurred, about 37 within the no attack national preserve. And this was a record for, for the, the park area over the last 60 years to have that many, many fires occurring. Um, not all of them were large. You can see the red perimeters of the fires, um, but and some of them remain fairly small. But, um, you know, is this going to become more common? It followed up by 2010, there was a large fire season in 2012 as, in this region as well. So potentially we will see more fires occurring. I mentioned about shortened fire return intervals, and that is where areas are burning um, beyond what they naturally do in the fire regime. And this map, uh, has shows the red perimeters, the red areas are where all of the fires have occurred since 1940 or what we have mapped. And the yellow are showing places where it's burned, yellow and orange are showing places where it's burned multiple times. So that's basically a 60 year fire return interval. But yet most of our 
tundra areas, we don't expect fires to occur more than um, you know, every 100 years. So if we look in, you can see it up here in NOATAC, there's some areas of yellow. Uh, there's a area over here on the Seward Peninsula where it has been burning multiple times. And um, so that was noted in, in Kyle Jolly's paper in 2010, that the tundra areas definitely seem to have uh, lots of repetitive fires going on. In the boreal forest, it's something that has um, definitely raised the concern of managers, fire managers, and land managers uh, as you know, we kind of utilize old burns as, as a fuel break. And we expect that uh, if a fire burns up to a recent fire, that it's going to slow down or, or stop. But if it, these are no longer working as fire breaks, um, that's, that's of concern. And so there's uh, currently some research going on looking at how uh, why is it and why are they burning that way and why are they burning into these recent fires? So burn severity and fires. Burn severity is probably one of the biggest drivers of effects of fire, um, both from the vegetation, um, also from the soils, uh, also potentially water quality. All of that can be affected by what the severity of the fire was. One of the things is the, the terminology of fire intensity and burn severity can oftentimes be confused. Uh, generally, your fire intensity is when the fire is occurring right, right during the, the time that the fire is burning. And it's often a description of how, what the heat was, the sur whether it was a surface fire or a crown fire, um, or whether it was smoldering, or smoldering and how long of time it, it was residing in that area. Uh, fire intensity will also uh, result in the combustion and the emissions that are given off of a fire. Your burn severity, on the other hand, is more the effect after the fire. Uh, one of the things is that, you know, if you have a 100,000 acre fire, it doesn't all burn in one type of severity. It's variable across the landscape. And um, the burn severity is going to affect your ground vegetation changes, and it's also going to affect organic soil consumption. Um, and all of this will then ultimately affect you know, what happens at that site, your plant establishment, your thaw depths or your permafrost, and then other ecosystem services. So you know, what, what will happen to the berry production and or your wildlife that might use that, that site. So burn severity is important. And to give you some examples in Tundra of what we mean by burn severity, uh, the top photos are a high severity site. These little knobs that you see are remnants of, of tussocks that have burned um, with such high severity uh, that they can't re-sprout. All of these photos, or, or these photos are all one year post. So normally, right after the fire, they're gonna re-sprout. Um, and if, if it burns so deep and deep, deep into the soils, uh, it will kill or can kill these tussocks. We don't see a lot of that in tundra fires um, normally, but we may see more of that. Uh, moderate severity, generally you're going to burn in between the tussocks, maybe kill a couple of them, and you'll burn through the uh, those shrubs that are there. Those will burn. And, and then these are kind of an unburned site, what it would look like without fire in it. But the severity is also going to influence your um, how much is consumed in the organic material? And if you hear um, news or read about, you hear about carbon release and, and ancient stored carbon, that's from these, these organic soils. So these are uh, dug down into the ground, uh, and this is mineral soil here, and this is basically decomposing plants and moss material that's been charred or burned off of the top, and there's very little of this left. On a moderate severity, it's gonna burn down a little bit more, um, but not as severely as a high severity site. And here's one that's an unburned um, uh, soil and moss uh, organic monolith. So the question of how, how how do fires burn? I mean, what kind of severity do we see in these tundra fires? Uh, we've done some work with the Park Service, and there's been other work done um, uh, by Nancy French and uh, uh, Tatiana Loboda looking at burn severity and seeing how it 
how these satellite mapped uh, severity maps are working in the field. Uh, and this map shows basically an example of the red areas are higher severity. Um, here's a, a field site that matches up to that. The light yellow and orange are um, low to low moderate severity. And if you look at this map, a majority of it actually is low or unburned um, severity uh, for, for this fire from 2012. When you use the this monitoring trends and burn severity data, um, just kind of out of the box, this is what they show. A majority of the fires are, are low um, to moderate severity. So, and this seems to be the norm, it's at least of what I've seen in a lot of fires, is it, it's not burning real high severity. But what might we see in the future could look something more like this, which is the Anaktuvik River fire um, up on the North Slope, where they, a large majority of the area burned in high severity. Um, and part of the reason was because this was a very late burning uh, fire. Um, it burned all the way from, uh, I believe it started in June and burned into October. Uh, and it had the, the soils and the organic material were drying out. And as a result, they saw some pretty high severity sites in this area. So this could become more common and which could be a little more problematic. So the other thing with climate change is we might expect uh, changes in the fire season and the duration of the fire. Um, some of the, the studies being done in the Arctic network uh, by Dave Swanson are starting to show some trends of snow off occurring earlier uh, in, in the Arctic network area of the Park Service. Um, and this could influence when we might get fires. Obviously, we won't have fires occurring if there's snow on the ground, but if it's starting to see earlier springs um, or later with snow off um, in the fall, uh, that could influence when we get our fires occurring. Um, there's lots of uh, papers and discussions about the warming um, records, the, the temperature records in in the Arctic and seeing an increase of that. And then, I, as I mentioned with the Anaktuvik River fire, um, seeing these long duration tundra fires, a, a fire that burns from June to October in a tundra fire is, is fairly unprecedented and uh, clearly also had some, some impacts on that fire. And then there's also been discussion about more lightning occurring in the tundra regions. Um, this graph, which uh, this goes to 2007, is for uh, the North Slope ecoregion and showing um, the number of lightning strikes by year, but you see this large increase that's occurred. And some of this is because the uh, we have, we've got better lightning detection going on, um, which is helping detect more lightning, but there is does seem to be um, discussions and, and talk about more commonly seeing lightning in, in the North Slope where they hadn't seen it before. All of these will influence how much fire burns. So from the, the implications of, of an increased fire landscape, um, clearly there could be some effects on the vegetation and soils and permafrost. Um, these could also influence uh, wildlife habitat and subsistence resources. And then also, of course, there's concern about carbon emissions and are we feeding the system by uh, putting more carbon into the air? Um, and are we releasing ancient uh, stored carbon in tundra when we have these fires? When you think about, or when I think about the, the you know, studies of fire in tundra, um, there's a lot less material about the impacts of fire um, in in tundra areas than there are for the boreal forest. So there's a lot of kind of new information coming out and probably some areas that we need to get more information on how do fires impact uh, uh, the, our landscapes. So as I mentioned, vegetation changes is, is a potential for increased fire. Um, and as I've also said, the severity of fire uh, is very important. So what happens after a fire is going to be dependent on the
the severity of the fire, the pre-fire vegetation, what was there on site before it burned, and then the seed sources that are available. And all of these will influence what may happen at these sites. I'm going to give you a couple graphs um, just showing how severity influences what, what vegetation is there. And these are all one year post fire. So um, in, a, in the unburned plots that we had, uh, the Ariophorum and Carex, which are tussock forming uh, sedges, uh, were about 60% cover in the unburned. The low severity was more in the 45%, and you can see it dropping down. But even in the high severity sites, we still had a fair amount of cover. Um, you can see these, these uh, tussocks are re-sprouting one year post-fire. But the one thing that um, is striking is the grass cover. So um, in these high severity sites, we're tending to see grasses, which are different than these sedges. Um, so that may be one effect of these high severity uh, sites is having more grasses uh, occurring after a high severity fire. Again, one year post fire, uh, looking at shrub cover, you can see as the unburned um, in these, these low shrubs include Labrador tea, uh, dwarf resin birch, blueberries, and willow. Um, our cover of some of the plots that we had that were unburned was about 45%. Um, and even in the low, moderate, and high severity, it starts dropping pretty rapidly. So it's burning those, those shrubs fairly readily. Um, but they're still there. They're re-sprouting. They're coming back um, after the fire. But in one year, they're still pretty small. Uh, dwarf shrub cover, that includes uh, cranberry, cloudberry, blueberries, uh, crowberry, and bog rosemary. Again, a fairly large drop even with the different severities, but um, you see that you know they are still present at 5% at, at high severity. So those are just really small little starts that are there. I have a couple photo series showing um, fires after, uh, after a couple different, well, this is moderate severity. So we had a, in 2004, um, and this is actually um, about two weeks after the fire occurred. This is, uh, this is a, or actually it's three weeks after the fire occurred. Um, it's already greened up, so that's that upper left uh, place. The 2005, one year after that fire, uh, you can see the, the tussocks are blooming, the cotton grass is blooming. Um, they often tend to have this flush of of, of flowers, and they actually are setting their seeds on the Ariophorum uh, the year before. So they're setting their seed and then bloom, or setting their, their inflorescence the year before, and then they're blooming the following year. So this fire caused this to uh, put flowers out uh, for the following year. Seven in 2007, so three years after the fire, and just uh, in 2013, we went back to these same sites and what we did find is that they tend to almost have the same composition as some of the control plots that we went to. There's not a lot of difference in them um, in the vascular plants, but the difference are the non-vascular plants. The mosses and lichens are not the same anymore there. This is another example, same kind of same series of you know, one few weeks after the fire, a year after the fire. Uh, three years after the fire and um, nine years after the fire. I think I said 11 on the last one. But again, um, responding fairly quickly to after fire in these situations with moderate severity fires. Chuck Racine um, was one of the kind of the, one of the early pioneers with looking at tundra fires. Uh, he established plots after the large 1977 fire season um, and happened to uh, also put some plots in uh, along in the Seward Peninsula and then also in the Noatak. And this one was actually um, a fire from 1980-81 that they, or 82, um, that they they put in. And we went back and re-monitored those 
And you can see, again, in these shrub tussock tundra, they're looking pretty similar. They're, there's not a lot of change after you know, 20, 20, or 12 to 20 years. Um, they're kind of back to the same in the um, vegetation composition. And there's other studies that have shown this. Uh, but the changes that can occur are in places where you might have high severity fires. So this is a, a Racine plot that was put in uh, Nimrod Hill um, on the Seward Peninsula. And uh, pre-fire, it was a dwarf shrub tundra, and it burned fairly hot. You can see the severity of this, this fire in 19, 1977 fire. It burned, um, and there's basically bryoids and sort of a dry site. And they went back, and uh, six years later, it's a sedge meadow. And 28 years later, by the time we go back, it's willow shrubs. And that's a big change, going from a dwarf shrub type to a willow shrub type. Part of the reasoning behind this is because of the severity of the fire. Um, the soils were, uh, ad were available for seeds, for the willow seeds to blow in here and establish, um, is my guess on what had happened in, in a lot of the site. There were willow bands just off to the other side. But the severity um, of the site definitely influenced what vegetation was coming back. So vegetation is really just wildlife habitat. And um, this is probably an area where we need more work done um, on, on a variety of species uh, in the tundra areas and the impacts on fire. But you know, certainly there's been a lot of work, and I'll, we'll talk a little more on the caribou, um, uh, looking at caribou habitat and fire effects. Um, and there's been some recent paper that came out on the moose, uh, moose in Arctic areas, uh, and that potential uh, increase of habitat for moose. But probably less studies have been done to look at, um, you know, fox or snowshoe hare or the birds or impacts of, of bears. Um, my guess is that for the most part, these species. The snowshoe hares would probably do well with fires, um, and the, the birds, depending on where they're nesting, um, is going to probably depend, depends on, uh, I guess, basically the nesting habitat of the birds. The fox will probably do well in response to snowshoe hares, and then also voles can be prolific after fires. But this one area, there's a, more studies in the boreal forest, but less uh, has gone on in the, the tundra areas of, of effects on wildlife. I think one of the um, clear studies on, on fire and fire effects on, on wildlife is uh, both with caribou and moose. Um, Kyle Jolly and others have done a fair amount of studies looking at the western Arctic caribou herd and um, have radio collared caribou and looked at places where they're avoiding going to um, because they are looking for the for the winter winter browse of uh, lichens and if it's burned it's probably not going to have that much lichen in it. Um, there's a lot of literature out there by Kyle and other folks that have studied um, the effects of fire on the, the winter caribou browse that's um, this lichen shown in this middle picture here. Um, there's a recent paper by Ken Tape and, and others um, looking at range expansion of moose in Arctic Alaska and looking at climate change. Um, if we start to see more, more willow in the area, we will likely, um, it may be a boon for the, for the moose. So. More work to needs to be done, definitely, in that area. So I guess to finish things up, um, we'll go into the, the carbon, the question of carbon, um, stored carbon emissions and the age of organic soils. Um, I guess go, going back to this photo here, this is a this is an organic soil sample that was taken in a tundra area. And you can see that it's almost a, 20, 20 centimeters deep. And this is what they're talking about, the storing of organic um, and 
uh, old carbon are in these organic soils. And so there, we had a study that looked at um, how old are these carbon, the carbon, this plant material, this decomposing plant material, how old is it? And, um, and are we actually burning old carbon? Um, there was some work initially done by Michelle Mack. She found um, up on the north slope that that uh, that area was burning primarily younger carbon. And our work in no attack is also showing similarly that most of the carbon was less than 50 years old um, on the surface that was getting burned. But as you get into these um, more high severity or areas that have burned multiple times, um, it's projected that these these carbons would carbon would be much older in the ranges of 600 to uh, 800 years uh, 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 in age. So we're working on a publication on that currently. So as I mentioned, the, the organic soils um, that Michelle Mack and others uh, co collected, they found that most of the the organic carbon that's being emitted is young, um, but uh, potentially these deeper organic layers are going to have uh, older carbon. Another concern, obviously, is um, the emissions. Um, Mac and others uh, projected that almost 2.1 teragrams of carbon were emitted from the Anaktuvik River fire, which is a lot of carbon. Uh, it's almost 2.3 million tons, and that's of concern, obviously, if we're emitting um, that much carbon into the atmosphere. So last is a little bit about fire and permafrost. Um, clearly, burn severity is going to influence, have the impact of on permafrost and thaw. So that um, insulating organic layer, um, if that's all burned off, you're going to uh, basically have more thawing occurring. and more work has been really done on fire effects in permafrost in the boreal regions, but we're starting to get more research on it um, in the in the tundra regions. But um, in general, if these these sites have a lot of ice richness, a lot of water to them, there's going to be a greater impact post fire. Um, this example shows uh, areas where the hydrology has changed. These are actually from boreal forest sites, but um, the hydrology has changed in this area due to the permafrost thawing um, after a fire. There's also concern of methane release as we um, thaw some of these frozen grounds in, in the tundra um, and also burning into the deep peat layers um, and peat bogs from Canada. There's some studies um, showing, uh, you know, as we're burning these old peat bogs uh, that there is a fair amount of methane released uh, from the fire fires going through there. So just to kind of summarize what's gone on or what you know how how we see fire affecting uh, tundra and um, generally we see low to moderate severity or, or is, is the norm for tundra fires, but we may see changes in that. Um, even in the high severity sites from the Anaktubic River and some of the places that we've seen in no attack, uh, we still see re-sprouting occurring. Um, and we probably have a, a pretty resilient system um, for the vascular plants, um, which are the, the shrubs and grasses and um, graminoids that are out there. But the largest change is going is going to be to the non-vascular communities, the mosses and lichens. Um, and that's because they're consumed often in the fires. They're the top layer, and they're also the things that dry out. Um, some of those lichens and some of the mosses take longer to, uh, to, to regrow back into a site. Um, so that's that definitely will change as, uh, I guess, as we see more fires. And we may also see, with warmer temperatures, um, vascular plants, shrubs, overtopping the lichens and basically outcompeting the lichens. There's studies going on that as well. 
Um, we may see some grass increase. Uh, grass is increasing with high severity fires. And then in some situations, we may see shrub increasings um, after uh, high severity fires. Or just with increased temperatures, we may see um, shrubs more likely to occur. And certainly increases in alder are a huge uh, part of um, some studies in the tundra areas. Uh, you know, how will alder um, influence the fires? Definitely um, with increased temperature and lightning, uh, we will definitely more than likely we'll see more fires in the tundra areas. And this rapid fuel biomass regeneration, the ability to, uh, to regrow fairly quickly after a fire, means that these areas could burn fairly quickly again, you know, in 50 to 50 to 5 to 20 years. Um, and we're seeing that type of fire return interval already in some of the regions of, of tundra. The organic soils are definitely vulnerable to fire, um, and they're going to be more vulnerable with increased fire frequency and increased severity of fires. So climate change is going to impact the extent, seasonality, and the effects of fires. So I'd like to thank you for joining us. And uh, this concludes my presentation for today. And please tune in for other presentations on fire at ANRO. Thank you.